The important topics will be covered through a series of lectures. In that, the first lecture I want to take as an introduction to the nephrological syndromes. So these were on the topics given to me to cover as per the chapter. So this in this class we will be seeing the introduction to the nephrological syndromes. So before going into the applied anatomy, physiology and the syndromes related to the nephrology, which is important for the final MP students, there are few MCQs I have kept it in the beginning so that the students will be focusing on the uh, class contents and subsequently at the end of the class they can answer it. So you can go through the questions one by one. There is edema, there is a mark of normal blood pressure, and there is a beer bottle with excessive bubbles. What is the diagnosis? CKD to define the kidney dysfunction to be present for more than how many months? That's one simple question for the UG students. 45 year old male, severe vomiting and diarrhea with kidney dysfunction. What is the possible etiology? Clearly, a K infection induced AK is CKD or the nephrotic syndrome. And uh, the major difference between nephrotic and nephrotic syndrome is <coughs> which of the following is very rare. This is with respect to the UTI. One simple question What is the diagnosis in a male who is presenting with kidney dysfunction for four months? Simple question, simple answer out of these four. Again, connect and make the diagnosis. There is some image with the throat inflammation. There is a blood in the urine. Blood pressure is high. Patient presented an emergency. What could be the diagnosis? This is a simple spotter. This we will skip. So we'll start from the applied anatomy. The one important point with respect to the before starting the applied anatomy physiology is the location of the kidney. This is the exact location of the kidney. It is located along the 12th rib and the 11th rib. This is the renal angle between the outer part of the 12th rib and the left part of the erector spinae where you call this as the renal angle where there is a tenderness in case of urinary tract infection, especially the pyelonephritis. So this is the location of the kidney. And observe the kidney where it is located, how it gets Observe the kidney where it is located, how it connected to the iota, IVC, ureter and the bladder. Why this anatomy is important? Because we are going to see about the acute kidney injury and the chronic kidney disease. So the applied anatomy is important. The outer part is the cortex. The inner part is called the medulla. These are called the pyramids and the normal Adult kidney size is 9 to 11 centimeter. Each kidney contains around 1 million nephrons. These are few important MCQ points with respect to the applied anatomy. So, as I told, these are the cortex, this is the medulla, medullary pyramids. In between, this is called as the renal column. This is called the calyx. There are major calyx and the minor calyx. Minor is the branching over here. The renal artery, renal vein, this is the renal pelvis. This is also important because the infection of the pelvis can be called as pyelitis. This is the ureter, the outer covering is there, this is the renal capsule and this part is the cortex. This part is the pelvic calicial system. The stones are more common here. With respect to the kidney parts which are very important to understand the nephrological syndromes. Yeah, another image again to show the calyx, pelvic calicial system, 
the renal cortex renal medulla most of the nephrons are located the glomeruli are located in the cortex only in the medulla most of the time it is the tubules there are two type of nephrons extraglomerular <coughs> There are nephrons which are focused more on the filtration. There are nephrons which are more focused on the concentrate, urinary concentration. So most of the nephrons are located in the cortex in the medulla. The juxta medullary nephrons are located here. And one more important point with respect to the kidney blood supply is kidney receives around 20% of the cardiac output, which is equal to are approximately 1000 ml per minute why this is important this is important because whenever there is a cardiac failure there will be a renal dysfunction to understand those things you should know the blood supply of the kidney which is around 20 percentage of the cardiac output so next this is the kidney now we have taken a cut section over here and we are expanding here so this is the nephron, blood vessels are there, artery, vein and the tubule. What are the four important components of this? So this part is the glomeruli, which is the head of the nephron. Head portion is the glomeruli. Why I have kept these images? There are four important components where the pathology can occur. First is the interstitium. What is the interstitium? The part which is other than the vessel or the tubule is the interstitium. Second is the blood vessel. Third is the tubule. Fourth is the glomeruli. So these are all the four important components where the pathologies can occur. Example acute interstitial nephritis, thrombotic microangiopathy, acute tubular necrosis. That we will see in detail when we are seeing acute kidney injury in the CKD. As of now, you just remember anatomically there are four infinite components which are located, and these four components are associated with various pathological process. These components are involved in various pathological process. Next, the renal vasculature. The kidney is being supplied by the Renal arteries, which is the branch of iota, right and the left. Once the renal artery comes from the iota, it gets divided into the segmental artery, interlobar artery, interlobular artery, arcuate artery, and it arcuate artery, interlobular artery, then it forms the affluent arteriole. Then again, it comes back through the almost in the same branching pattern. So this is the upfront arterial from where it comes from the interlobular artery renal artery there are multiple branches finally the blood comes here so this is the place where the blood gets changed into the urine just for your understanding i'm saying there are multiple channels which are involved in reabsorption of various electrolyte and all that we will see separately just remember there is a tubular structure where various changes in the filtrate occurs and finally the urine is formed what is the normal gfr it is 120 ml per minute or 180 liter per day thus much amount of blood is being cleared every like approximately 120 ml per minute is being cleared every minute and with respect to the part, this is the front arteriole, different arteriole, this is the glomeruli or the Bowman. Like this part is the glomeruli, and this component is called the Bowman's capsule, proximal converted tubule, loop of handling, distal converted tubule, collecting duct, and the outer urinary flow. So from the iota, main renal artery, segmental artery, then the interlobar artery arcuate artery interlobular artery then the glomeruli so once the glomeruli is reached then efferent artery it forms the vasa recta then vein the drainage is almost similar to interlobular vein arcuate vein interlobular vein segmental vein and the main renal vein and into the ivc this vasculature is very important because the renal artery stenosis it is common in the main renal artery 
and for NCQ point of view also, this is the branching of the renal artery and how the apparent artery was formed. This section is the most important image to understand the various nephrological related disease process. You have to understand this section clearly. The blood comes here. This enters into the capillary loops. These are called the capillary loops. There are multiple branching of the capillary loops and the blood exits here. Since the filtration occurs over here, the blood vessels are being covered by some zipper like cells. These are the podocytes along with the basement membrane. Here is the basement membrane, then podocytes. Once the filtrate occurs here in the space, the urinary space, the urine starts forming and it enter into the tubules. This is called the parietal epithelial cells, Bowman's capsule. This is the glomeruli. You leave apart this part for the time being, just focus over here. This is the Bowman's capsule. And in between this capillary loop, there will be mesangial cells. Suppose if we take a cut section at this level, like if we are taking a cut section at this level and seeing how it will appear. This will appear like this. This is the image that is given in David's one. So to understand that, you should know how the section have been taken. So this is the capillary loop. Here the endothelium is there. Then comes the thick blue color structure is the glomerular basement membrane. Then these are the photocyte, photocyte food processes. <coughs> In between the capillary loop, there is the mesangium, apparent arteriole, different arteriole. This part I will explain you separately. So from the blood, the urine is being formed, like filtrate is being formed. The parts this part is also called the urinary space or the Bowman space. This is the parietal epithelial cell lining. This is the visceral epithelial cell. Parietal is outside, visceral is inside. And the parietal epithelial cell is also called as the photocyte. Understanding this component is very very important because majority of the physiological process, nephritic, sorry, pathological process, nephritic, nephrotic, Glomerulonephritis, all kind. The pathology will be somewhere here only. So, understanding the structure is very, very, very important. Don't get confused with the basement membrane that has given over there also. Here is the basement membrane. So, if we take a cut section at this point, like the rectangular box, then it will appear like this. This is the capillary lumen where the blood is there then capillary endothelium then the glomerular basement membrane then the photocytes these are the photocyte photocyte is having primary food process secondary food process basically it forms a zipper like structure see how it is like giving a margin to the capillary loops because this prevents the leakage of blood protein into the urinary space and one important point over here is what is the normal GBM thickening approximately around 390 nanometers. And once we uh, expand this structure or once we uh, like this is another cut section of this one before expanding we will see another cut section again the capillary endothelium glomerular basement membrane the podocytes with the food processes these are usually having negative charge. That is how it ripples the albumin. The albumin won't be able to enter here because of the presence of the negative charges over here. I have shown this image almost once, twice and here also I have explained. Why I am explaining again and again? Because this is very important to understand the nephrological disease syndromes. So this is the cut section again of the photocytes. You see there are various components like laminin, agrin, alpha actinin, there are receptor negative charges there, nephrin, catherine, photosin, dystroglycan, and collagen 4. Collagen 4 is the glomerular basement membrane, it is the capillary loop. I have kept this image just to show there are various components in the photocyte. If it gets affected, it will result in disease process. 
For example, codosin mutation causes congenital nephrotic syndrome. Nephrine mutation causes congenital nephrotic syndrome. Collagen alpha 3 chain causes some disease. Alpha 4 chain causes some disease. Alpha 5 causes some disease. For example, alpha 4 causes Each is associated with one disease. One is associated with thin basement membrane disease, one with good pastor, one with Alport syndrome. You can study which is the chain which is involved in which disease because this is one of the important component of the MCQ. And uh, this component is not very important for the UG final examination, only you have to know collagen type 4. So this, those are the things which are respected to the applied anatomy. Now with respect to the applied physiology, what are the important functions of the kidney? First is the endocrine function. Second is the important excretory function. Third is the homeostatic function. As we say here, excreting the nitrogen waste product is very very important. That is urea, creatinine and other high molecular and low molecular weight nitrogenous waste products. That is also called the uremic toxins. This is also involved drug elimination. That is why in kidney injury or chronic kidney disease, we have to modify the drug dosage. It plays a very important component in the blood pressure management, electrolyte balance, acid base regulation, and the osmolarity regulation. It forms the active form of vitamin D. So whenever there is a kidney failure, vitamin D metabolism is also affected, there will be low vitamin D. It produces EPO which stimulates the hemoglobin like RBC production. This EPO is being secreted from the peritubular fibroblast. So this is a short summary about the applied physiology for the UG students. So what are the syndromes, what are the disease process overall if we take the nephrological syndromes. These are acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, rapidly progressive renal failure. This I have added here to make your concepts very clear which will help you in your entrance exam also. Because in Davidson this part is not clearly mentioned what is the time duration and all because in the MCQ there will be a question with respect to aka RPRF and time duration and other two important uh, syndromes which is the nephrotic syndrome acute glomerulonephritis or the nephritic syndrome urinary tract infection renovascular hypertension asymptomatic urinary abnormalities and rarely cystic renal disease so these are all the overall whatever the nephrology related disease usually comes falls under any of this category Today we will see till here. Four and five we will try to cover in the subsequent lectures. Six and seven, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight and nine we will cover it together. Before going into the acute like, injury or the syndromes, you have to be aware of few terminology like azotemia. What is azotemia? This is nothing but the accumulation of the nitrogenous waste products. Uremia is the clinical manifestation. For example, patient comes with uremic gastritis, uremic pericarditis, uremic coagulopathy, oliguria. Oliguria is passage of less than 400 ml of urine over 24 hours. Anuria is the passage of less than 100 ml of urine over 24 hours. This is just a summary slide to show what are the symptoms the syndromes can manifest. It can be flank pain, hematuria, anuria, oliguria, passes out large amount of urine, burning victuation, edema, anasarca, shortness of breath, other systemic manifestations secondary to uremic toxin. This nematuria hesitancy incontinence usually of the lower urinary tract symptoms. Nematuria is the passage of air, hesitancy, like patient. Or like having difficulty in passing the urine incontinence they won't be able to control the urine because of the various symptoms the patient can uh, present with with respect to the nephrological symptoms nephrology are the urinary tract related symptoms 
So since I have told you regarding the symptoms, how we are going to diagnose those from the history, then patient examination to detect the clue, urine examination, what are the findings we are going to see in the urine, what are things we have to check in the blood, how the imaging is going to help, how the kidney biopsy is going to help. So this will be helpful only if you know what is the actual pathophysiological process which is occurring in each syndrome. First we will see that what is acute kidney injury. Previously this was called as acute renal failure. Then later they have changed the name because they have found this not actually failure this is some sort of injury. So what is the definition? It is defined as the sudden impairment of the kidney function which occurs over hours to days resulting in retention of the nitrogenous waste product which are normally cleared by the kidney. This is the definition you have to write in the exam whenever they ask what is acute kidney injury. And what is the exact time duration they have mentioned as hours to days. For MCQ purpose and for the uh, standard nephrology textbook also, if you take the kidney dysfunction, if you take the timeline, if it is less than 7 days, usually it is labeled as acute kidney injury. If it is more than 3 months, this is the chronic kidney disease. And in between, it is RPRF, also called as rapidly progressive renal failure. From 7 days to 3 months. Why they have changed the terminology? Because the kidney function is rapidly deteriorating to reach CKD. We have to find out the etiology. If it is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, that means it is the glomerular involvement. Here is the rapidly progressive renal. The cause may be anything. This is the terminology. So if it is the less than 7 days, you will name it as AKA. 7 days to 3 months if there is a renal function rapidly progressive renal failure and if it is more than 3 months it is called as a chronic kidney disease. As we see here in the chat when I when I am going to take about acute kidney injury I will be telling in detail about uh, all the components what is the etiology how to diagnose and all. For the time being just remember it can be classified into pre-renal AKA when the pathology is before the kidney for example in the blood supply severe diarrhea vomiting the perfusion to the kidney is reduced then it is called as the pre-renal aka severe blood loss second is the intrinsic aka intrinsic renal aka when the problem is within the kidney and the third one is if it is in the uh, like after the kidney that is the collecting part even in the pelvic calcium system or here if there is a pathology which resulting in glomerular dysfunction this is called as post renal AKA. so AK is classified into pre renal AKA, intrinsic renal AKA, and the post renal AKA. so that is all regarding the acute kidney injury now we will see what is CKD in short for the UG students just you have to remember this Definition as per the KDGO. KDGO is the uh, standard international guideline group which makes guidelines for the kidney diseases. This is the Kidney Disease International Global Outcome. This defined is CKD as structural or functional abnormality of the kidney which lasting for more than three months with the implications for health. Functional if the EGFR is less than 60. Structural is shrunken kidney. So, for the time being, remember it's a structural or functional abnormality of the kidney lasting for more than 3 months with implications for health. This you leave, just remember only this. So, now we have seen aka grossly, what is aka, the renal dysfunction, CKD, renal dysfunction more than 3 months, in between is the rapidly progressive renal failure. So now we will see the next syndromes, nephrotic syndrome and the acute glomerulonephritis. nephritis. 
this nephrotic syndrome what is this to understand nephrotic syndrome again i am taking you to the applied anatomy part the blood is coming blood is filtered albumin is retained in the blood vessels whenever there is a leakage of albumin into the urinary space the albumin gets lost in the urine so that result in hypoalbuminemia which results in edema so the urine from the urine sorry from the blood the albumin and the protein starts leaking why it is leaking because of the abnormality in the filtration barrier most commonly in the podocyte in the podocyte glomerular basement membrane like mainly the podocyte pathology where it is in the leakage of the protein into the urine so what happen when the protein leaks into the urine like this give this what frank starling law states that if inside the blood vessel the hydrostatic pressure pushes the fluid outside the vessel oncotic pressure pulls it in oncotic pressure is because of albumin if albumin is lost the pressure to pull the fluid inside is lost so what happens most of the fluid goes outside which result in edema so nephrotic syndrome definition it is defined as the kidney condition that increases the permeability of protein across the glomerular filtration barrier which results in proteinuria hypoalbuminemia edema and hyperlipidemia so the basic pathophysiology is the proteinuria what is the level there is some more than 3.5 gram of protein loss normally is less than 150 mg here what happens it is more than 3.5 gram of protein loss which results in hypoalbuminemia which results in edema atanasarca because of the excessive albumin loss liver start producing albumin along with it, there is excessive production of the high density low density lipoproteins which results in dyslipidemia and the hyperlipidemia sometimes it might appear in the urine where it is called the lipiduria this image i have kept just to show because of the excessive albumin in the urine the urine negative charge is high so the urine form excessive bubble the patient used to say is passing a uh, frothy kind of urine there will be excessive frothing this is typical of nephrotic syndrome patient usually says i'm passing excessive bubble, uh, bubbling of urine so this is one of the important component of the nephrotic syndrome and why there's a periorbital puffiness in congestive cardiac failure it is more of pedal edema in nephrotic syndrome also sometimes it start as periorbital puffiness it is because of the hypoalbuminemia which is more seen in uh, kidney related condition which result in the accumulation of fluid in the periorbital space loose areal or tissue there is a accumulation of fluid which result in periorbital puffiness which is also typical seen in nephrotic syndrome now is the acute glomerular nephritis it is nothing but the glomerular glomeruli inflammation nephritic syndrome is it different almost both are same it is a inflammatory condition of the glomeruli that's all nephrotic can be non inflammatory but this is the inflammatory condition many places the definition is not clear but you have to understand the concept that it is basically a inflammation of the glomeruli so here basically the protein leaky condition the protein is getting leaked mainly the albumin which result in cross proteinuria but here it is the inflammation of the glomeruli whenever there is inflammation what happens not only protein blood also leaks so there will be hematuria not only blood since it is getting inflamed urine output also goes down sometimes the renin might be released since kidney is not filtering urine volume get accumulated inside the blood vessel this might result in hypertension so if we take proteinuria hypoalbuminemia 
and edema as three component of nephrotic syndrome here there will be two additions hematuria oliguria and these three will be of less severe intensity see in the nephrotic only the protein leakage occurs because of the pathology and the photocytes and the glomerular filtration barrier whatever it is like it might most of the pathology are in the photocyte it can be primary or secondary we will see once we are seeing the nephrotic syndrome what happens in the nephritis there is a inflammation so blood also leaks in sometimes this gets accumulated there will be oliguria there will be hypertension 72 release of renin also like only difference you have to remember is there is a presence of hematuria oliguria will be there proteinuria we don't know what is the severity level it will be usually of less severe than the nephrotic range usually it is less than uh, 3 gram only not in the nephrotic range edema will be there we don't know what is the intensity but it is usually of less intense than the nephrotic syndrome so coming to the definition this is the clinical syndrome that present as hematuria elevated blood pressure decreased urine output and edema proteinuria plus minus might be there mostly on the lower level less than 1 gram less than 3 gram the underlying pathology is the inflammation of the glomeruli acute glomerulonephritis or nephritic syndrome or most same rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis if there is a dysfunction of the kidney so these terminologies are vague this is with respect to the duration if the glomeruli is involved here some books mention as acute glomerular nephritis or the nephritic syndrome you can remember like this so we have grossly covered a case secretion rprf nephrotic and nephritic syndrome one introduction about like a summary point about the syndrome urinary tract infection from the kidney till the urine goes out any part of this urinary tract can get infected that is called the urinary tract infection if the kidney parenchyma gets infected, it's called pyelonephritis. If it forms the abscess inside here, it is called as pyonephrosis. If there is presence of gas in the renal parenchyma, that is called as emphysematous pyelonephritis. Emphysematous is nothing but whenever there is an accumulation of gas in the surroundings, like emphysematous cholecystitis, is gallbladder infection. Usually it is by E. coli and is more common in the diabetic group. If there is abscess over here, that can be referred as renal abscess also. Infection or inflammation in the pelvis is the pyelitis. The infection of the ureter, which is very very rare, is urethritis. The infection of the bladder is cystitis, urethritis, prostatitis also comes under also from center urinary tract infection so this is the syndrome diagnosis of infection of the urinary tract so we have covered aka ckd or prf nephrotic syndrome nephritic syndrome you have understood what is the concept behind the syndromes urinary tract infection and the asymptomatic urinary abnormality i will tell you while taking the class on urinary examination Cystic renal disease, just remember autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease are there. This is not very important for your practical exam with respect to the UG, but for PG, this is very very important. So now we will see few points about renovascular hypertension. When to say as renovascular hypertension? So just to make you people understand, this is the kidney. Whenever there is a reduced perfusion to the kidney, like there are one important component which is the juxtaglomerular apparatus, we will see it separately just for timing. Remember, there is a reduced perfusion to the kidney. What happens? It releases renin. Renin through the various process stimulates angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, like renin can helps in the conversion of angiotensin ogen to angiotensin 1 from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 is formed this image is very important for your mcq purpose from where this is produced from where this angiotensin converting enzyme is there and which part of the 
uh, step this enzyme renin helps so once the angiotensin is there it has multiple effects what happen it increases the blood pressure basically it tries to retrieve the renal perfusion like there will be also constriction there will be release of aldosterone so this resulting or this manifestation which result in increasing the renal perfusion basically the blood pressure increases so whenever there is a renal artery stenosis what happens the kidney perfusion decreases so this cycle gets activated so there will be elevation in blood pressure so this keeps on going so patient usually presents as young hypertension so whenever there is a problem in the renal vasculature which results in hypertension that is called as the renovascular hypertension this is a, one of the syndromes with respect to the nephrology and the other one is the cystic kidney diseases so so far we have covered about covered or we have given an introduction about all the syndromes related to the nephrology so we will see the answers for the mcq that i kept in the initial pages so the answer for this is normal size of the adult kidney is 9 cm normal protein excreted per day is 150 mg per day and the albumin excretion is less than 30 mg per day this is nephrotic syndrome because patient is having fitting beetle edema this I have kept to show the excessive frothing secondary to the albumin release in the urine and most of the nephrotic patients syndrome patients are usually normal tensile mostly compared to the nephritic syndrome so CKD2 defined the duration is more than three months severe vomiting and diarrhea what is it so most likely pre renal aka major difference between nephrotic and nephritic is edema can be seen in both proteinuria can be seen in both the degree usually varies hypoalbuminemia can be seen in both with respect to this mcq the answer is hematuria because hematuria is more seen in nephritic and it is commonly not seen in nephrotic hypoalbuminemia is more in nephrotic it can be very minimal in nephritic but for this MCQ, hematuria can be a better option than hypoglycemia. Which of the following is very rare? Urethritis is very rare. Four months, the diagnosis CKD. Throat pain, hematuria. Basically, it's a acute glomerulonephritis. Once we are when we say about the nephritic syndrome, we will tell regarding the post infectious glomerulonephritis. Usually, the patients have hypertension, hematuria because of the oliguria and reduced renal function. They usually present an emergency. Like in this case, I have formulated like this like they have renal dysfunction. That to show that I have mentioned this image. So, this is just a periorbital thickness, simple spotter, nephrotic.